The big island of Ambon in the Moluccas was an important air and sea link between Australia, New Guinea and the Northern Netherlands East Indies, the NEI. And with this in mind, the Australian and Dutch governments came to an agreement regarding its defence in 1941, a few months prior to the Japanese attack. An Australian infantry unit, the 2nd 21st Battalion, was dispatched direct to Ambon, numbering with attached anti-tank, engineer, medical and other supporting units 1,100 men, to assist a local Dutch garrison force numbering 2,600. In addition, the Australian government dispatched No. 2 Squadron, RAAF, a Lockheed Hudson bomber unit, to provide the Australian and Dutch defenders, known collectively as Gull Force, with some air cover. All of the troops were placed under a joint command headed by a Dutch army officer, Lieutenant Colonel J. R. L. Kapitz, with Australian Army Lieutenant Colonel L. N. Roach as second in command. Colonel Roach, commanding the Australian forces, divided his men into two echelons, sending one to defend Leha Airfield, one of two airfields on Ambon, sited on the west side of the island. The second echelon was dispatched to dig in east of Ambon Bay, to the south of the main town of Ambon, where any Japanese landing was predicted to come ashore. When it appeared off the coast of the island, the Japanese Ambon invasion force consisted of the aircraft carriers Hiryu and Suryu, assorted escorting warships and about 5,300 Japanese troops, consisting of sailors from the 1st Kure Special Naval Landing Force and Imperial Army troops, the 228th Infantry Regiment, which consisted of three battalions. From the beginning, Roach had asked his government in Canberra for more artillery and machine gun units, but Australian Army headquarters ignored these requests. In fact, Roach made so many requests for more men and equipment in the face of a predicted Japanese invasion, even asking that if his men could not be reinforced, they should be withdrawn to Australia, that he was removed from his command and sent home in disgrace, having committed the cardinal sin of putting his men's lives ahead of political considerations. His replacement as second-in-command of Gull Force was a far more amenable 53-year-old staff officer named Lieutenant Colonel John Scott, who arrived on the 14th of January 1942. This was an unfortunate appointment, because Roach was a far more competent and experienced officer than Scott. As Roach had warned, it soon became apparent that the Dutch and Australian troops of Gull Force were completely inadequate for the task that lay ahead of them, being too few in number and under-equipped to prevent the Japanese from conquering the island. It was exactly the same situation as that already faced by Lark Force on New Britain, covered in Episode 1. Colonel Scott reconfigured the island's defences. Ambon is shaped like an hourglass or figure of eight. With this geography in mind, Scott believed that a Japanese landing would come in the north, for the south of the island was considered too inhospitable to make any attack a practical proposition. This was another error. The Japanese invasion began with a softening up of Ambon Island and its defenders with carrier-based aerial attacks and naval bombardments from cruisers and destroyers covering the carriers, preparatory to an amphibious assault. The island's only air cover, the Australian Air Force Squadron, was ordered to withdraw by command in Australia, and bereft of mastery of the skies, the Dutch and Australians were hard-pressed to prevent the Japanese landing on the 29th to 30th of January 1942. The main Japanese landings came in the south of the island, while all the Allied defences pointed north. After 24 hours ashore, Japanese naval landing troops and soldiers had managed to surround many of the Dutch positions, and Colonel Kapitz and his officers attempted to fight their way out of numerous encirclements and coalesce on Ambon City. An urban environment offered more chance of a static Dutch defence holding out until relieved, rather than being outmaneuvered by rapid Japanese movements to flank them in the open countryside a tactic the Japanese had already mastered fighting the British in Malaya.
but the Japanese were one step ahead of Allied defensive moves, and a second amphibious assault was launched from the task force, with several thousand more Japanese troops coming ashore in the north. The Allies had made plans to withdraw into the northern neck of the hourglass-shaped island, but this was dashed by the appearance of strong Japanese units behind them. The second echelon of Australian troops defending the eastern shore of Ambon Bay and the approaches to Ambon City were first engaged by the Japanese on the 1st of February. The story of driver Thomas Doolan of the 2nd 21st Battalion exemplified the desperate fighting around the island's main settlement and the bravery of the outnumbered Australian soldiers. Doolan was stationed at a large Australian food dump located at Kudmati on the town's outskirts. The arrival of the Japanese in force caused the Australian section covering the dump to withdraw back towards the town as they were heavily outnumbered and outgunned. Doolan, however, refused to leave, and all alone he decided to take on the Japanese single-handed. After concealing himself in some undergrowth, the plucky Doolan, armed with his Lee-Enfield rifle, a revolver and six hand grenades, engaged the first Japanese troops that advanced on the dump with a withering fire. A few days after the surrender, Australian prisoners discovered Doolan's body where he had fallen, fighting to the end, and in a rare display of respect, the Japanese allowed the prisoners to give Doolan a proper Christian burial and to erect a wooden cross over his grave. Doolan's personal sacrifice probably appealed to the Japanese military spirit of holding a position until killed. It was now the turn of the Australian troops dug in around Leha Airfield, now bereft of any serviceable Allied aircraft on the northwestern shore of Ambon Bay, under the command of Colonel Scott to receive the attentions of the Japanese. On the 1st of February, the Japanese attacked, and during sporadic fighting, 15 Australians were killed and over 35 wounded. After two days of fighting, Scott assessed the situation, coming to the conclusion that the tactical situation was now hopeless, and he would be wasting his men's lives by continuing to defend an abandoned airfield. On the 3rd of February, Scott ordered all Allied troops, Australian and Dutch, to lay down their arms and surrender to the Japanese. Australian and Dutch resistance on Ambon therefore ended in an ignominious, unconditional surrender. If the men had known what horrors awaited them at the hands of their Japanese captors, it is probable that they would have fought to the end like driver Doolan, rather than have submitted themselves to a terrible captivity. By the end of the war in 1945, nearly 75% of Gulf Force had perished while prisoners of war. This astonishing figure includes over 300 Australian and Dutch soldiers who had been tasked with defending Leha Airfield, who were put to death by the Japanese Navy in an orgy of brutal and sadistic murder sometime after their actual surrender. The Japanese then attempted to cover up what they had done with a wall of silence among themselves after the war, for we are only able to reconstruct the events at Leha from the interrogations of two Japanese who did talk to Australian army investigators, as not one of the 312 Australian and Dutch soldiers present lived to tell what happened. Leha Airfield in February 1942 was garrisoned by the 1st Kure Special Naval Landing Force. Naval landing forces were the Japanese equivalent of the Marines found in most other navies, though with some important differences. The Japanese Navy did not possess a force of naval infantry on a par with either the British Royal Marines or the US Marine Corps. All Navy personnel had received basic infantry training as part of their initial seamanship and trade courses before going to sea. Japanese sailors were expected to be proficient in the use of infantry weapons and to know simple battlefield tactics and formations. However, they remained primarily sailors and not sea soldiers. In February 1942, preparations were underway on Ambon to kill all of the Australian and Dutch prisoners who the Japanese had captured defending the airfield from the invasion. According to the interrogation of Rear Admiral Koichiro Hatakiyama, the commanding officer of the 24th Naval Base Special Force, he ordered his namesake, Captain Konito Hatakiyama, commander of combined forces, to execute all Allied prisoners of war on the island's Hitou Peninsula, 
Captain Hatakiyama in turn ordered Lieutenant Nakagawa to conduct the actual killings using men from his first Kure Special Naval Landing Force. The first group selected were 46 prisoners, led by Major Newbury of the Australian 2nd 21st Battalion, and a working party had moved to a quiet location in woods on the edge of the airfield in preparation for this group's disposal. Two large circular pits had been dug, each six metres in diameter and approximately three metres deep. Testimony of what occurred there on the evening of the 6th of February comes from the post-war interrogation of Imperial Japanese Navy interpreter Suburo Yoshizaki. The naval personnel who would conduct the executions had all willingly volunteered for the task. The sailors involved in the first massacre of Major Newbury and his men numbered about 40, under the command of Lieutenant Nakagawa and Warrant Officer Yamashita. A 25-man detachment came from the Yamashita Shotai Platoon and another 15 from the Yoshiwara Shotai Platoon. The motive given to Australian investigators for the killings was established to be revenge for the death of members of the Sashio units killed in the Lawa River Battle, in particular Warrant Officer Yoshiwara during the Battle of Ambon. Yoshizaki had left his barracks in company with another interpreter, Terada Okada, and Petty Officer First Class Tazuki Yamashita, and together they walked to the execution ground. Standing round the edges of the pits were one or two naval officers and about twenty enlisted men of various ranks. Although both Yoshizaki and Okada were technically civilians, they wore officers' uniforms, minus badges of rank, and each carried a sword. Before the executions commenced, an enlisted man walked over to him and asked to borrow a sword. Yoshizaki lent the man his, and the sailor thanked him and returned to the pits. Yoshizaki missed the earlier executions of Major Newbury and his men, but he did witness the second execution of the night, when a second group of prisoners, consisting of Wing Commander Scott and personnel of the RAAF, Australian Army troops and Dutch soldiers, totalling 59 men were beheaded. It is believed that Captain Hatakiyama was also present, but the actual execution party was commanded by Warrant Officer Kakitaro Sasaki, officer commanding Machine Gun Company No. 1 of the Kure Special Naval Landing Force. It is likely that Flying Officer William White was among the RAAF personnel about to be killed. White, a Hudson pilot with No. 2 Squadron, had been stranded on Leha Airfield when his unit had withdrawn after his aircraft had sustained serious damage on the 20th of January. As the military situation deteriorated around the airfield, defended by Colonel Scott's 1st Echelon of 2nd 21st Battalion, White and 10 other Australian Air Force personnel had decided to get off Ambon altogether rather than become prisoners of the Japanese. A party set off in a requisitioned boat across the narrow straits that separated Ambon from Seram Island to the northwest, where arrangements had been made for their rescue by an RAAF aircraft. Unfortunately, White's boat was intercepted by a Japanese patrol vessel and all the airmen were made prisoners. Hauled back to Ambon, White and his comrades were all beheaded at one of the executions that took place at Lehar Airfield. It was no understatement that the secretary who informed White's mother of her son's fate in 1946 wrote that the pilot had died in circumstances which are an affront to civilization. William White, although he never knew it, was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for his daring and skill during the aerial battle of Ambon, the medal being presented to his mother after the war, along with the terrible news of her son's pointless murder. The first prisoner, an Australian, was led forward to the edge of one of the pits, and he was forced to kneel and his head was pushed down, exposing his neck. His uniform was tattered and dirty, and he was shaking with fear, his arms securely bound behind his back. Warrant Officer Sasaki stood behind and to the left of the prisoner, and slowly raised his katana samurai sword high over his head, both hands gripping the hilt. Silence descended among the onlookers, and then Sasaki brought the blade down swiftly, severing the Australian's head from his body. The head rolled into the pit, and as arterial blood pumped in a shower from the corpse, other Japanese sailors pushed the still twitching body over the edge of the hole. <laughs>
A great cry went up from the Japanese sailors, demonstrating admiration for Sasaki's skill. For the bound prisoners waiting further back in the woods under a heavy guard who had just seen their own fate played out before them, the mental anguish of these men suffered is impossible to imagine. There was nowhere to run to, the Japanese would not listen to reason, and exhibited no compassion whatsoever for the sufferings they were inflicting upon helpless men. All would react in different ways when their turn came to be led away like animals to be slaughtered, and Japanese witnesses remembered how many had understandably cried out or pleaded for mercy. Others were probably so overcome by fear and despair that they said little, while many would have been crying for mothers, wives and children they would never see again. Others accepted their fate with stolid silence. Many would have prayed, together and individually, and said their goodbyes to their brothers in arms. As soon as Sasaki had beheaded the first prisoner, another was dragged forward and forced into position by the Japanese guards. Sasaki dispatched four prisoners in quick succession, and then the ordinary sailors who were queuing up, eagerly around the pit, clutching borrowed swords, came forward one by one to commit murder. After each decapitation, the sword blade was carefully wiped clean of blood, and the weapon was passed to others waiting their turn, as the sailors laughed and joked with each other, and coached one another on the correct way to hold the sword and make the cut. With the light fast fading from the sky, battery-powered torches were broken out, and the beams used to illuminate the necks of the successive victims. Most of the common sailors knew little of swords and the correct methods for using them, so that many of the executions were terribly botched. For the prisoners awaiting a quick death, their agonies were multiplied by these incompetent swordsmen who slashed at necks and often failed to decapitate their victim cleanly on the first cut. Some unfortunate prisoners, according to Yoshizaki, were pushed into the pits while they were still alive, slowly bleeding to death from botched sword cuts across their necks, heads and shoulders. The interpreter's sword was later returned to him by the young sailor who commented that it was now blunt and that the blade was slightly bent after the decapitation of a giant of a fellow. Yoshizaki and his companions left the scene of the executions before the completion of the massacre and walked back to their barracks. By the end of the night, all 105 Australian and Dutch prisoners were dead, and the pits were covered over with earth. The methodical executions were to presage a much bigger massacre, perpetrated against Allied prisoners later that month, also on the edge of the same airfield. Evidence of what occurred during the second execution, conducted on the night of the 24th to 25th of February, is chiefly derived from the interrogation report of Warrant Officer Keigo Kanamoto, Officer Commanding L Repair and Construction Unit, which was part of the Kure No. 1 Special Naval Landing Party. Kanamoto's unit was stationed close to Leha Airfield at Victoria Barracks. On the 24th of February, he was informed that approximately 220 Australian and Dutch POWs would be put to death that night, or punished, as the Japanese commanders termed it. The executions were scheduled to commence at 6pm, and being interested in watching, Kanemoto decided to attend. He took along with him two enlisted volunteers, Seaman First Class Teruji Ikazawa and Shikio Nakamura. When Kanemoto and his companions arrived at the execution ground, it was dark, and the slaughter was already well under way. Once again, a working party had dug two large circular pits, about five metres apart, that would serve as mass graves. Several large bonfires had been lit, flames dancing among the trees and across the terrified faces of the prisoners standing under guard close by, waiting to be led to the edge of the pits. This vision of hell was completed by the impish men with swords who stood gathered around one of the pits, chatting and laughing as successive prisoners met their end kneeling in their comrades' blood. Around thirty Japanese sailors of various ranks were doing all the killing, and Kanemoto watched, fascinated, as a young Australian, his arms bound, was dragged kicking and screaming to the edge of the pit and roughly forced into the execution position. The sailors laughed at the Australians' pleadings, but silence soon returned when his head was severed and his crumpled body was kicked into the hole. Within seconds, another prisoner had been decapitated on the opposite side of the pit.
Once again, torches were shone on the exposed necks of the victims as the light from the bonfires was not strong enough. After he had watched his colleagues kill twenty Allied prisoners, curiosity impelled Kanemoto to step forward and peer into the execution pit. What he saw disturbed him, and according to his post-war interrogation report, some corpses were headless, but several bodies with heads half-attached were jerking feebly and making faint gurgling moans. Captain J. G. Godwin, investigating officer of the 2nd Australian War Crimes Section, recorded in 1949 that Kanemoto avers that a feeling of revulsion mixed with pity swept over him, but he could not interfere in the punishments that had been ordered by the Japanese High Command in the area. The reason why these Australian and Dutch prisoners were being killed has never been fully established. The Japanese who were interrogated said it was because a Japanese minesweeper had been sunk in Ambon Bay after running over an Allied mine, and the crew was permitted to take their revenge against local prisoners of war. Certainly Kanemoto commented that most of the executioners that night were a crew of the sunken minesweeper. Post-war Australian investigations have established that a party of at least a hundred Japanese sailors from a minesweeper, under the command of Sub-Lieutenant Fukuda, acting on direct orders received from Admiral Hatakiyama, acted as the executioners. As mentioned, the Japanese Navy used the term punishment in place of execution when referring to what occurred at the airfield. They punished the prisoners by transposing responsibility for the destruction of their minesweeper onto them. In this case, punishment entailed mass murder. Many of the Japanese present that night may very well have been revolted or upset by what they were ordered to do, and what their comrades were willingly doing all around them. Certainly, this was a line taken by several Japanese, who were carefully interrogated later by Australian investigators. It was fair also to assume that due to the levity, banter and ribald comments constantly being made by the Japanese taking part in or watching the executions, most were not viewing their victims as human beings, but as playthings in what was degenerating into a twisted form of sport. Kanemoto, whether he was genuine or not, and Captain Godwin harboured doubts about Kanemoto's claim that he had not participated in the executions, was right in his assertion that he felt unable to speak out and put a stop to the massacre. The Japanese military culture of total obedience of a superior's orders, regardless of their nature, was deeply instilled in every Japanese soldier and sailor. In a culture that glorified sacrificial death for the emperor and castigated surrender as dishonorable, prisoners of war were non-entities. The Japanese group ethic, which dominated and still largely dominates all aspects of life, meant it was social suicide to stand outside of the group and challenge the legitimate authority of one's superiors. Such a stance was unforgivable, and rarely did a Japanese soldier or sailor dishonour himself or his family by an exhibition of what might well be termed disloyalty by his masters. When approximately 40 executions had occurred, Seaman First Class Nakamura could no longer restrain himself by merely watching the proceedings, and at his urgings Kanemoto lent him his sword. Nakamura beheaded four Dutch prisoners in rapid succession, and then he passed the weapon to Seaman First Class Ikizawa. This sailor cut the heads off three Australians, and then in turn passed the sword along the line to others of his comrades who were awaiting their turn. Kanemoto's sword was used to kill three more prisoners, but the final execution was botched. A sailor struck a prisoner twice with the sword before decapitating him and the second blow produced a strange sound and sparks. When Kanemoto recovered his sword and examined it by torchlight, he found that there were nicks in the blade and the weapon was slightly bent. Kanemoto watched as the executioners continued their work, the shouts of jubilation, as Kanemoto described them, made by the sailors in their ribald comments when prisoners begged for their lives, apparently disturbed him. He and his companions eventually left the scene, and although Kanemoto told other comrades that he had decapitated prisoners, he said he made these claims in order to save face. By any account, the executions were completed by 1.30am on the 25th of February, and 227 headless corpses lay piled inside their earthen graves.
The pits were filled in, and the Japanese sailors returned to their normal duties about the airfield. Many Australian prisoners were spared being massacred at Leha Airfield, but ended up dying anyway. Herded into unsanitary prison camps at Ambon, they were transported to the island of Hainan in China, but at both locations they were worked as slaves, exposed to every tropical disease in the book, barely fed and routinely abused by their sadistic captors. On the 25th of October, Colonel Scott and 500 Australian and Dutch prisoners had been herded into the bowels of the hell ship Taiko Maru and transported to Hainan. Scott proved to be singularly unpopular amongst the prisoners, largely because he bizarrely enforced Japanese-style punishments against prisoners over matters of discipline instead of King's regulations. As Dr Peter Stanley of the Australian War Memorial has remarked on the whole sorry Ambon affair, three quarters of the Australians captured on Ambon died before the war's end. Of the 582 who remained on Ambon, 405 died. In 1946, the largest of the Second World War's war crimes trials was convened by the Australian government on Ambon, its purpose to bring to trial those responsible for the Leha airfield massacres. Ninety-three former Japanese naval personnel were arraigned and placed on trial for their lives. Many were convicted, and four Japanese were sentenced to death for their parts in the massacres. Rear Admiral Koichiro Hatakiyama was charged with having ordered both massacres of Australian and Dutch soldiers at Leha Airfield in 1942. He would undoubtedly have been found guilty and sentenced to death. Unfortunately, he managed to cheat the hangman as he died before his trial could begin. Captain Kunito Hatakiyama, the naval officer who had directly commanded both of the massacres, was found guilty and hanged. But, as in so many other similar cases across Asia and the Pacific, the great majority of the murderers, those enlisted men and NCOs who had wielded the swords, were never brought to account for their actions, and they escaped justice completely. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe and share. Please also visit my video channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. Thank you.